Welcome to this afternoon's American Security Project webinar. This is an on the record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website. All audience members will be muted during the discussion. And with that, over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Adam. Good afternoon from Washington. I'm Patrick Costello, Chief Exec Executive Officer of the American Security Project. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual meeting. <clears throat> Following Russian President Vladimir Putin's announcement of a quote unquote special military operation early Thursday morning, Russian forces attacked Ukraine from multiple sides. The aggression from Putin came as the UN Security Council was meeting in an urgent bid for peace. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has issued a state of emergency declared martial law and is calling on all citizens who can fight to prepare to defend Ukraine. As thousands flee, there are reports of Ukrainian soldiers identifying and conscripting any man aged, six, aged 18 to 60 from the displaced peoples fleeing the Russian invasion. President Joe Biden, along with EU leaders, announced additional sanctions that are designed to completely sever Russia's asset, access to Western financial markets. The United States has also deployed troops to Europe and place thousands of our men and women in uniform on heightened alert to reassure NATO allies. It's too early to tell how all this ends. Joining us this afternoon to try and make sense of the war in Ukraine, the largest continental, uh, largest conventional conflict in Europe since World War II, is former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. Secretary Hagel is a member of ASP's Board of Directors and was one of the founders of the American Security Project. Secretary Hagel also served as Secretary of Defense when Russia first invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea back in 2014. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us. Let's get started. Before we get into the current situation, as I mentioned, you were serving as Secretary of Defense when Putin first invaded Ukraine in 2014. If you can briefly take us into the Situation Room and how you advised President Obama during that episode, and how did then Vice President Biden react? Well, uh, first, thank you, Patrick. and. Um, Thanks for all the good work ASP is doing, not only on this project, but uh, uh, all the other issues that you tackle every day, particularly energy. Um, in 2014, Russia surprised everybody uh, by not just invading uh, and occupying Crimea, because they didn't have to do that. They were already there. Their troops were on the ground. They had a long-term lease commitment with the Ukrainian government. So their, their troops were there. Also, I might add that 98% of the Crimean people are Russian nationals. And Crimea has always been a stepchild of Kiev. They would be cut off from the power grid. Money never got down to them. So it wasn't a real difficult task for the Russians to take Crimea. Uh, the eastern border of Ukraine was different. So after the attack, which was a surprise, um, that was the attention, the full and complete attention of the, certainly the Department of Defense, but the State Department, all of President Obama's government. One of the issues that we had to face and what we were gonna do was the ability of the Ukrainian army and armed forces. Uh, they weren't very well trained. Um, they couldn't handle even the most modest and sophisticated weaponry. So that was a dilemma for us because we couldn't get weapons into them. As you're seeing now, the United States provided weapons. Uh, the Germans just decided to do it, UK, other nations. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to help them. So we decided in those meetings in the National Security Council that we would provide non-lethal defense weaponry that, that we knew we, that the Ukrainians uh, could handle. Um, also, we tried to off-ramp Russia on this through, um, yes, some sanctions, uh, but uh, more diplomacy. And uh, Putin stopped. I mean, he didn't go any further than where he was in East, Eastern Europe. Crimea was where it is. Uh, that led then to the Minsk talks, Minsk one, Minsk two, um, and, and kind of a quieting of what was going down. But this was uh, every day for a couple of weeks in the National Security Council room, and sometimes twice a day, uh, sometimes by phone. Um, 
it was a it was an interesting it was an interesting situation with NATO and the EU because it uh, was totally unlike what it is today. I mean, with a, with a full invasion of a nation, uh, with what I think is a clear intent to take control of that nation, Ukraine, and capture its government or drive its government out of Kyiv. Um, that was never the threat that we saw, never the, never the issue. So uh, NATO and EU's response was a different kind of response. Uh, one reason, and as you know, a third of Europe's energy comes from uh, Russia. Uh, and the Germans were building the, in the process of building the, the gas pipe. So there was not a lot of appetite in 2014 uh, by members of NATO and Ukraine saying, well, um, Ukraine's not a member of NATO, not a member of the EU. And so we had to work around that, but it was a different time, totally different. This is a, a deadly, deadly serious situation that we face now. Thank you, sir. Let's uh, continue to unpack what this means for global energy policy. I believe that it's a critical moment for global energy policy. So far, Russia's energy sector has largely been spared from the West's sanctions, though it's one of the country's most important industries. Uh, Russia is the world's third largest crude producer, providing roughly 10% of the world's oil, and it's the second largest natural gas producer. So should we start imposing more punitive measures on Russia's energy sector, or do you think on balance it's best not to, so that we could try and insulate Americans from rising prices, a spike in energy prices, especially considering the, uh, the inflation that we're currently experiencing, the highest rate in four decades. Well, Patrick, unfortunately, we're going to be hit for, with this too. Um, every nation in Europe is gonna be hit. Nations around the world are gonna be affected by this. Certainly energy, certainly the freezing uh, of all, all bank activity. Uh, exports, imports, uh, supply line chains. Um, Russia, as you know, is a big uh, producer of aluminum and copper uh, that, that we use, our automobile manufacturers use. So everybody's going to be hit with this, and we are too. And President Biden has been very clear on that. Uh, energy uh, is going to be one of the commodities that's, that's going to really be hit. Um, how, how do we deal with this? How do we improve it? Well, uh, the short term is probably not a good answer. Your national uh, reserves, petroleum reserves, that's not the answer. That, uh, you use that up in a month if you really want to go after it. So what we've been doing uh, over the last couple of months, we, as you know, are a huge producer of natural gas. LNG, and we've been building LNG ports uh, here and around the world. So we can help through our exports, increased exports of LNG. Uh, Cutter, we've talked to Cutter about increasing LNG. So we're trying to replace all this Russian uh, gas with, with other means of uh, supply. Uh, we probably won't be able to do it 100%. Um, so we're gonna to have to just deal with this and work with other countries. But the good news, if there's any good news uh, in all of this, is that the Europeans are working with us, the 27 European Union countries, the 30 NATO countries, well, 29 without us, uh, like uh, I've never seen in my lifetime, because I think they all recognize how damn serious this is. And so energy is, is a big piece of this, but it's only one piece. And the, the other factors and pieces that I've already mentioned, and there are even more. But when you freeze bank accounts and you freeze banking transactions where nothing can move and you freeze assets around the world, which we are doing, not, not just in the United States, but everywhere. <clears throat> it's happening in the UK, UK excuse me, in Germany. And, and uh, that is a, a big problem, a big problem for Putin. Let's continue to talk about the economic dynamics of this conflict. Uh, Putin prepared for a standoff with the West. He built up the country's um, foreign currency reserves to the tune of over $640 billion to insulate the Russian economy, the so-called fortress economy. Uh, it was a solid plan, 
until the US, the EU, and global partners announced uh, stinging sanctions against Moscow. So what have been the costs for Russia so far in terms of capital flight out of Russia, uh, devaluation of the Russian currency, the direct costs of sanctions? Well, as you know, uh, sanctions usually don't produce an outcome for the first week, few days. It takes a while. It takes a few weeks. It depends on the, the, the uh, depth of the, and the strength of the sanctions as to when you start to see the consequence of those sanctions. But I suspect we're, we'll start to see some significant consequences in a week or so. Um, and uh, I think what you'll see to begin with uh, a blockage of <clears throat> export imports. When, when you look at the, the trade that Russia relies on as well to Europe, back and forth, United States, other countries around the world, and it's significant. When you, when you take the very basis uh, of the export process, the financing, how do you finance your exports? Uh, and when you put a freeze on that, a hold on that, nothing can move. And then, then when you go further, like with SWIFT and, and other uh, options, uh, you, you see that they've got very few options. The other thing that's important to remember about Russia, Russia has no allies. I mean, China and Russia play with each other, but they don't trust each other. They don't like each other. They never have. Uh, so Russia's without allies. And if there was ever a time in the history of man that allies proved to be very critical, and allies always have been, but I think sometimes uh, we don't appreciate how important they are. It's right now uh, to have the allies with us as, as we continue to engage all of this. So Russia's gonna be in a, in a tough spot here. It talks about its reserves, $630 billion in reserves. Well, a lot of those reserves are out of their country and they're being frozen. And then, then you've got other factors that are involved in this, uh, Patrick, dead Russian soldiers coming home. And there, there are some now that have been brought back to Russia, but there are going to be more if Putin continues uh, this invasion. Um, the, not only the economy, the, the society of Russia has not been that great. Uh, the uh, oligarchs are doing well, and the thieves are doing well, as they always do everywhere. But they're, they're now being sanctioned as well, just like Lavrov and Shoigu and Putin. So uh, this, this noose tightens in many ways around Putin, and he, and he can't undo that noose because as long as this, the West stays strong on this and the United States, uh, it'll be significant. And you'll start to see, to your question, uh, real consequences show up in, in about a week. But they're already showing up. And it'll be in every sector. It'll be in every part of society in Russia. But we'll be affected by it as well. And right on top of inflation. I mean, it'll add to inflation. It'll add to all the other problems that we've got in the rest of the world. But this, this, is, this is a question that the United States has to ask itself in every nation. I mean, when you break the post-World War II world order by one nation invading another nation, uh, that, that changes the world. It changes all dynamics of the world. And you got to stop it. I mean, you don't have to look any further than 1938 in Munich. And this has got to be stopped. And I'm, I'm so grateful that the Europeans, where all of that bloodshed occurred in World War I and World War II, well, not all of it, the South Pacific, Japan, and so on, but so much of it that they've come to realize, and I hope they continue to realize, how important all of this is to stop this. Let's talk about the conflict itself and the human toll that it's taken uh, thus far. There are reports that between 3,500 and 5,000 Russian military personnel have been killed or injured thus far. That's in five days. Um, for context, there were approximately 2,400 U.S. service member deaths in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan over the totality of that conflict. Given the cost thus far and the reports of very low morale among the Russian military, what do you think of their capacity to carry on the fight? and the willingness of the Russian people to suffer the human cost? Well, a, a good question, and I think it's a real issue. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we tend to forget, in some ways, the humanity and the human dynamics of war. Well, if you look at the history of Ukraine and Russia, uh, obviously, it's a very close, strong, 
generational relationship. Uh, people in Russia today, people in Ukraine today, have relatives in each country. They're very close to you. They go back and forth. Uh, not only are they relatives, but they're friends. They do business. Uh, this is generations that this has happened. And it always hasn't been pleasant, but that's the way it's been the last 30 years. And you're seeing protests in Russia today uh, against this. Those soldiers that the Russians have, they're all part of that society. They're not separate. They just didn't parachute out of nowhere. They come from those little towns in Russia and Ukraine. And Aunt Millie is upset in Russia because the Russians are, are killing Uncle Boris's son in Ukraine. That all factors into it. And that factors into the Russian army. And there, there will be morale problems. And there, there could be very big morale problems if this continues, uh, essentially killing their cousins. And that's a factor we should not uh, overlook in, in all of this. I want to get into some more questions about the conflict specifically, but I do want to um, dive <clears throat> into this notion that there might be popular dissent within Russia. And to the degree in which you think that even matters to Putin, do you think that there's a feedback loop between him and the average, um, the average man and woman on the, uh, on the streets in Moscow? Do you, do you think he's even a rational actor? Well, Mr. Putin is disconnected. He's disconnected from his own people. I think that's pretty clear. Um, you can tell that when you meet with him. And, and I've met with him, I've talked with him. Uh, and uh, that's a very dangerous sign. I mean, you look at all of them, the, so just the last 100 years of dictators in the world. Uh, they were disconnected from society. They were disconnected from the human, the guy on the ground and uh, the woman in the bakery and so on. They don't have any response for them. Uh, they're just pawns in, in this effort, but I've got larger, more glorious, bigger plans for our country. Uh, that, will, that will take a toll. Uh, Putin is a very smart guy, but he's a, he's a product of the KGB. Um, his whole life is mastering disinformation, misinformation, lies. That, that's what he brings to the government. So he's implement, implemented that in the entire government of Russia how they think, their culture, and their actions. <clears throat> and, and it's all an intelligence operation for him. And because he is isolated, as I said earlier, he has no allies, um, then that's a pretty, not only lonely job, but that's a job that, that will distract and distort your view of the world and your capability. One of the things that I've seen in the buildup to this, and now the last five days, is I think he terribly, terribly underestimated the West. I don't believe he ever, ever thought the West would hold together on this. Uh, but even more important than that, I don't think he ever believed, and this is, a, this is a consequence of not being connected with society, that the Ukrainians would hold on as, as they have held on. That uh, Zelensky says, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I know I'm there on their hit list. I'm not going anywhere. You've got Ukrainians coming back. Ukrainians are staying there. They're making this very, very difficult for the Russian army. Um, I think he misunderstood that terribly. And when, when something like that happens in a dictator's plans and a dictator's mind, uh, there's no good ending for him because this affects, <clears throat> you asked about the morale of the troops. This affects the morale of everybody in this and they the, as the troops look at each other and say, why are we killing these guys for what is the reason for this so you've got to add all of that up into some summation i think of answering your question and i think it's going to be a major problem for him i think it is a major problem already i don't know what's happening or if there's been a result of the the meeting today uh in belarus with ukraine and russia if we heard anything back from that but that'll that'll be interesting I would just say, before we let this specific point go, in order for him to get out of this now, because he's put all his chips on the table on this thing, and he's put his image, he's put his, his, his future, his judgment by history, 
he's going to have to find some way to get something that he can take back to the Russians to say, I won. Now he'll lie and he'll deceive, but it's got to be something. So uh, it is interesting, I think, that uh, he, he's willing to meet the Ukrainians. I don't think he'll have anything come out of it, uh, but uh, maybe another meeting or something like that. But all of these things are major pressures coming down on him because nothing is going well for him. Right. And uh, you're absolutely right that he does need some type of face saving measure in order to de uh, in order to de escalate. But I actually want to talk a bit about the escalation risk. We've imposed sweeping penalties aimed at crippling Russia's economy, choking off Russia from the international financial system, depriving the country of assets that are needed to stabilize its economy. Such a step has never been taken against a country with nuclear weapons or with one the size of a military as Russia has. So we're, we're about to crash one of the largest economies in the world. And I just want your thoughts on the escalation risk. Russia potentially takes kinetic action against a NATO ally or strikes back aggressively in the cyber domain. Could, could we trip into Article 5 territory here? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, give you an example, uh, Poland. Uh, a lot of the power grid that services Poland and Ukraine is the same power grid. I mean, you, you, could, you could see this thing escalating to the point that a lot of power gets knocked out. Um, some troops get it into Poland, Russian troops, um, on the border or whatever. You could see Poland going to NATO and say, I'm requesting Article 5 be invoked, and here's what's happened. The Russians uh, have attacked my country. One, two, three. You've got three Baltic countries. You, you've got the other uh, Eastern European countries in Romania and, and uh, Bulgaria. So uh, this, is, this is like hand, handling nitroglycerin, which I've said before. Um, it's hair trigger. A mistake here, a mistake there. Uh, as this thing escalates, it's going to get tougher and bigger, and the immensity of it is going to grow. You've got 44 million people in Ukraine. This is not a small country. Ukraine itself is a large country. You've got NATO countries around it. Uh, airspace issues, I mean, see, this thing is full of hair-triggered problems where, where it, could, it could bring on um, a request for invocation of a of an Article Five in NATO, uh, then then that's a real tough issue. Once that happens, and there there is no turning back on that. What NATO is uh, is prepared for, I think, in every way, is is what he started talking about yesterday or the day before about putting his nuclear uh, forces on uh, high alert. Uh, that that was, I think, somewhat rhetorical. Uh, I mean, I can't envision him in any way seriously thinking about using nuclear weapons, but you don't know. You, you can't take that as, oh, he wouldn't do that. You've got to be prepared for everything. I, I, I don't think it goes that far, but I think it could. When he starts jacking around with that kind of language, putting his, his nuclear people on alert, um, this means it's, he, he's headed for some bigger ground here, which everybody has thought or he's using this as a way of trying to settle it. Right. I, uh, I certainly don't want to test that proposition. I've been struck in recent days uh, by the elevated readiness of Russia's nuclear forces, questioning myself whether it is just rhetorical flourish or if we're actually talking about the real prospect of the use of nuclear weapons. It's certainly a road none of us want to go down. Um, I want to pick up on the NATO thread for a moment. Obviously, one of the key demands put forward by the, uh, by the Kremlin last December was the non-expansion of, uh, of NATO um, into Ukraine. But I think this episode is having almost the opposite effect. It's demonstrating the, the need for NATO. You're having countries like Finland and Switzerland, uh, the Sweden talking about potentially joining NATO. So doesn't this make the opposite case of what Putin was trying to demonstrate? Well, I, I think so. That's a good example of what I was referring to earlier. When I said I think he's misjudged all of this, and the the misjudgment has led to 
these kinds of realities that you just used one example of, and, and there will be more. I mean, Germany uh, doing what it did in the last few days about increasing uh, to more than 2% of gross domestic product through its defenses, shutting down the, the pipeline, which is a huge thing. Um, you're seeing Western countries react in ways here that are just opposite, like you said, of where Putin thought he was gonna go. And it, I do believe he thought those would, those would, be, would be just the opposite effects and consequences. Uh, that's all good news. And, and it's particularly good news because it's a reality check. And it's a, it's a framework of seeing the world as, a, as it is. This world is dangerous. And the more we get into it, you mentioned cyber. Uh, cyber uh, is a very convenient means of attack on every front for Russia. It is for China. The Russian cyber operation is very good. It is very good. One of the things that Biden said here, as you know, last week, working with private businesses here in the United States to harden their cyber defenses. We need to do that. We're behind in that. But our cyber capacity governmentally is, is better than anybody in the world. So it's really made us wake up as well. It's It shook us a little bit here, I think, maybe more than a little bit. And maybe, maybe just, just for a while at least, it's taken us out of this polarization and divide that reigns in this country. We can't govern in this country because of the political, political divisions and polarity. Uh, that's so dangerous, so dangerous in this kind of world. And I think Mr. Putin has, has uh, awakened all of us, awakened all of us as to how dangerous it is and how things can happen very quick. Uh, we're nearly out of time, but I want to just come back to one one thing that you brought up earlier, Mr. Secretary, and that is um, the potential alignment between China and Russia. In the run up to the invasion, a lot of uh, a lot of space in the uh, op ed pages of the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post were devoted to how China sees a potential uh, would see this action and respond to this action, obviously with an eye toward Taiwan. And there was also a lot of ink. Uh, used discussing a potential new axis between Putin and Xi Jinping. Obviously, they've met over 40 times. Um, just your thoughts on what this means for the future of China-Russia ties. Well, uh, I think, uh, as you've noticed the last couple of days, stories in the papers, Wall Street Journal, all, all the newspapers today, about China pulling back on that relationship, observing. Uh, where's all of this going? How's this going to affect us? Well, it's going to affect China, and it already is. Uh, China's very smart that way, very clever, very patient. Uh, they're not going to come to Russia's rescue with, uh, with this suicidal invasion that uh, Putin has dreamed up. and It's been in his mind for years and years and years. Uh, China's too smart for that. Uh, they'll take advantage of it when they see some advantages. If they see that uh, we're focused on Europe and Ukraine, if this goes on for a while, uh, you might see China uh, move even more provocatively on, on, around Taiwan, do some things. That's the way they operate. Um, and so the, the energy uh, trade relations, their trade relations with, with Europe versus trade relations with Russia the, it is, is miles apart. I mean, that European trade relationship that I think is near, near a trillion dollars um, 850 billion, something like that. I think Russia is 150 billion. And so for their own interest, uh, China is going to be very careful about this and do it, they'll do what China always does. Walk that kind of middle line, middle line, what's best for me? Well, yeah, we like you, Mr. Putin, but you know, so you know, it's just the typical way China operates and, and that's okay that they, they look at it that way in their own self-interest. And we know that, we know how they operate. We know what they're doing with, with Taiwan. They're looking for operations. But one thing about China, they, they don't just impetuously invade countries. I don't know, they're way too smart about that. They, they, they're patient, they play it out, put economics in the country. They, they build hospitals, they sign bauxite contracts for 25, 50 years. Uh, that's you never see a soldier, and I think that's the way they'll they'll continue to to play this. 
Great. Well, um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this afternoon. Uh, this is a, obviously a critical time for the situation. Uh, the American Security Project will be closely monitoring developments. We will be bringing in thoughtful individuals for conversations with our broader audience, just as we brought in Secretary Hagel, who is one of the founders of the American Security Project, or a phrase from Atchison, who's president of the creation, so to speak. Uh, but Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for taking the time to share your, uh, your views on the matter and let us tap into your wisdom. Again, my appreciation, sir. Well, you're doing a great job, Patrick, and everybody at ASB, and you're, you're providing a big and an important service uh, to this, this country and I think to the world. So keep going and doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Everyone else stay well.